Hello, everybody. Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Night. Uh, I've got with me today Brent Adamson. I'm sorry a little bit late, but actually he and I were chatting because we kind of do, do that um, beforehand. Um, Brent, just so you know, I can't find my copy of the Challenger sale. I don't. I, I think I've lent it out to somebody, but I do have the Challenger customer, which is um, an awesome book as well. Thank you, Tim. Truth be told, it's actually, if I may, um, the better book. It, it, that's just one man's opinion. I I keep my Challenger sale under the desk here to keep the table from wobbling. So yeah. you know, that's that's yeah, it's all good. It's, no offense taken. <laughs> So, so I, I and, and um, I, I, it's, it's probably it's one of the books that I think that comes up if you if you talk about sales books and book lists, it's probably the one that 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 is always on someone's list, some some shape or form, unless it's some list and it's a whole bunch of mates that they've they've created. But <laughs> usually, when people are honest, it's usually the, the one that's on everybody's list. Um, what 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 we wanted to talk about today was about why or what's changed in buyer engagement. Uh, yeah, well, and, and there's a lot and, there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, and and in only twenty minutes. Good luck, <laughs> and go. So, where should we dig in, Tim? What would you like to chat about? Well, when we talked and we did we um uh, we did the preparation, yeah. you talked about there being um, a process where you'd seen um, product selling, solution selling, being a thought leader, which was then challenger. Um, yeah. And then in a situation where, funnily enough, you mentioned this just before we came live, that customers are then overwhelmed. Um, and then it's about being being helpful. So t talk us through where you see where we've come from and where we are now into, from a self Okay. Because I think yeah, there's a sure. lot of people that, out there that would like to understand from Brent, Brent's perspective where we are staking the ground. So, so this comes from, uh, sad as I might, as it is to admit, from a lot of years of doing this, uh, I, I don't know when at some point in my career, Tim, maybe you're in the same boat, you actually can declare historical perspective, but mm -hmm. I'm, I've, I've now arrived and it's slightly depressing, but that's okay. But if I look back across, you know, I've been a professional for 35 years, but 20, some of those, about 20 of those have been specifically in researching sales and B2B sales and marketing complex yeah. sales. <clears throat> and if I think, Tim, across the last, you know, across those last 20 years, so when I entered the field, out of academics, it was about it's just right around the turn of me. It was about 2002, 2003. Um, and it was interesting at that time, all the research we were doing at a company called Corporate Executive Board, which became CEB, which then became Gartner. Um, all the work that we were doing in the sales practice at Corporate Executive Board in the early 2000s was all around this shift. You'll remember this, yep. the shift from moving from product selling to solution selling. Do you remember this one? said, I, I, said I, well, yeah. we need to. Yeah. So the, the idea was, um, Products can now become are easily replicated, uh, which leads us into commodity pricing, uh, fast followers. There's new technologies. There's new international entrants, which made it very hard to compete on individual products. Uh, and so the idea was, if I'm going to uh, escape the commoditization trap, if I'm going to demand a fair premium price for my my offering, I need to I need to cobble together something. Cobble's a little unfair, but I need to put together something bigger than just an individual product. I need to not just offer a product to the market, but a solution to the market, something that solves customers' specific business needs. Um, and so two things there. One is on the selling side, we need to figure out, all right, what are our customers' business needs? So it led to a lot of discovery and figuring out what our customer needs so I can I can better address them. And then on the strategy side, it led to a lot of uh, capability build out. So a lot of M&A activity, uh, a lot of organic growth where you take your uh, you, you build out your capability set. You surround your your products with services, for example. So the idea is that you know I've got all these capabilities, and one plus one plus one equals four. That the sum is greater than the individual parts, and therefore I can offer you something that you couldn't get by just piecemealing it in individual products elsewhere. It made a ton of sense. So this is I'm not here, nor was I then. Um, here to claim that that was a bad strategy. I think it was absolutely mandatory uh, that you go on that journey. And much of our research across sort of 2000 to 2010 was all about how to, so we were writing studies around things like simplifying solutions execution, I think was one of the studies we wrote, because it was hard, it's complicated to build those solution sets. Now, fast, so so that ran for about 10 years, and there was a lot of complexity around it. Um, but a lot of companies did that, I think did that really well. And Tim, you'll know, I mean, we can point to any number of examples of companies that built out just very quickly and very broadly, these really world-class solutions. My best example, I think is 
um, and there's it's all positive, but you know, take someone like FedEx versus UPS, global logistics. So one started with planes, one started with trucks, one was overnight, one was ground. And over time, they both, the other one bought, the one that didn't have planes bought planes, one that didn't have trucks bought trucks. They both bought, you know, retail outlets. And over time, they built out these global infrastructures that are world class global logistics solutions. The only challenge is they both did the same thing at roughly the same time. So fast forward 10 years where they found themselves and all these companies went on solutions journeys, not in a bad place. Like you would like, woe be unto you if you chose not to do that. But nonetheless, that window of differentiation, that window of opportunity to differentiate based on that solution was diminishing over time as others went on that same journey. So 2010, rough 2008, global financial crisis, 2008, 9, 10. What we found is a lot of our, our, our clients at the time at CEB were saying, solutions now we're getting not just commoditized on products we're getting commoditized on solutions we need a new sort of frontier of differentiation this is right about the time the challenger hit along with the gfc of the global financial crisis um uh, uh, there was uh, uh, an obviously an urgency to find new ways to compete to drive growth but also i think it was this waning the the, the mega trend was the waning of solution selling as an opportunity to differentiate yourself so um it was kind of perfect timing in a lot of ways, Tim, wasn't it? Was, which is, you know, the, if it's not, if we're not going to compete so much now on what we sell, we still have to compete on what we sell, just to be clear. So that window doesn't close. You still have to have a world-class solution. You still have to beat your competitor on solution capabilities. But that's harder and harder and harder to do as those differences become smaller and smaller. So what's the bigger incremental opportunity for differentiation? Um, much of our research indicated it wasn't so much around what we sell, but how we sell, how we go to market, the kinds of conversations we have with our customers. Um, for us, that became this thing we called commercial insight. We wrote the books on it. But interestingly, Tim, I think parallel to that and independent for those who, quote unquote, didn't get on the challenger journey, or never, maybe never encountered the books. There was still nonetheless, I think, an, um, uh, an embracing of this idea of thought leadership. If I could go to market with better content and demonstrate to our and I used to hear this all the time, still do. Um, mm -hmm. If we can go to the market and demonstrate to our customers that we have world-class leading insights and expertise that help our customers with their cutting edge solutions, their mission critical priorities. We're gonna build trust that we're the leading provider and they're gonna to come to us first with their, with their toughest challenges. And so we all kind of got on this content bandwagon, seems a little bit unfair, but, but there you go. Um, whether you call it commercial insight, whether you call it thought leadership. So around five years later, so 2015, um, you remember marketing developed this whole new strategy called content marketing. And all of a sudden yeah. now we had MarTex, we had technology to do this at scales. And then we had new, better, and better and new data to allow us to do this around 2017, 2018. So across that 10 year span from 2010 to roughly 2019, 2020, we all got really, really good at, at building and deploying massive amounts of not just content, but quality content. And so if you fast forward then another 10 years, so we go from 2000 to 2010 to 2020, where we are now, I think, is a place, and this, I wrote a lot about this in this article called Sense Making for Sales, which is in the Harvard Business Review in January, yeah. last year, so January 2022. Um, and this is all based on, just give credit where credit is due. A lot of the work we were doing at Gartner and CB, it's not, it didn't come out of my head. It came out of a really cracked team of researchers at Gartner. Um, but the, the idea being that customers are now not just overwhelmed with information, they're overwhelmed with high quantities of quality information. So you're telling yeah. me to zig, and you've got data, you've got research, you've got experts. They're telling me to zag. They've got data, they've got research, they've got experts. And so now I'm just confused at a higher level. I call this the smartness arms race. Do you know what it's yeah. like? We, and I think the smartness arms race has ended in a tie. So, so in other words, just as the window of your ability to differentiate based on your product is diminished, not, not disappeared, but diminished, then the window of opportunity to, to, to differentiate based on solutions diminished. I think now we're seeing the window of opportunity to differentiate based on insight and and um, uh, and and thought leadership is diminished, which is not to say, Tim, that I'm not suggesting therefore what should I do, Brent? Should I say dumb things instead? It's not like you, no one's going to unilaterally disarm in a smart disarms race. So that's not it. But what we're, I think what we need and we're on the cusp of and where we are now, in fact, and this is where we should go next maybe, is what's the next big incremental opportunity for differentiation? If those windows are, are not closing, but narrowing, is there a new window that's opening? And I think that's where a lot of my thinking is right now. OK. And and so, I mean, I, I, I can't remember. Mark Schaefer wrote an article uh -huh. um, about um, the fact that, you know, um, that we're going to we are overwhelmed with content. Yeah. Um, and 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 as you say, good content. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're all empowered with mobile phones. So where 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 do we go? 
Um, now there is a lot of rubbish content, and and you know there's there's I think it was even uh, Blake who's just put a, um, a comment in who said um, that um, I think you know ninety percent of or ninety five percent of content is never read. Um, <laughs> but but the fact of the matter is there is a lot of good content out there. Um, well, Blake, and I, I wouldn't suggest that the answer be, gosh, if we could just get them to read another 10% of the content, that would solve everything. I would imagine that, and nor I, do I believe you're probably saying that. I imagine it would just exacerbate the very problem. So the, the if I could, Tim, I, I think where we are now is, and this again, all credit to this, like the last couple of years that I spent at Gartner work on some really just incredibly profoundly interesting research around customer confidence. And yes. the thing that we consistently found at Gartner more than anything else and all the, because all of our work around sale, sale, selling or sales and marketing um, eventually seem to always come back to buying and how customers make buying decisions, not just how they buy, but how they decide. And the thing that we kept finding, and, and I still see today, is that what we're really seeing is customers need to have confidence in their ability to make broad scale or large scale decisions on behalf of their company, particularly in these large buying groups. And if that group of people doesn't feel confident to pull the trigger on even a medium scale decision, they're ultimately just going to say, we better either let's just not do anything, or they're going to say, let's study this more. Let's look at this more. Let's consider this more. And they're going to get continually even more wrapped so around we're, the we're talking about business to business enterprise where people are That's making right. um, large scale decisions it could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah and the buying team of well last time i looked at the figures it could be 10 people one of yeah, our easily. clients who's a, 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 a um supply chain software vendor tell me there's a hundred people involved in, in stakeholders. not surprised in yeah well you know by the way just as a quick aside though tim i think it's super interesting because the, the this phenomenon of lack of confidence. I don't. I, well, all the work I've done is most of the work I've been involved in has largely been around B two B and enterprise. Um, I was also involved in the the B two C marketing practice at Gartner, and you see the same thing on the on the on the B two C side, the consumer side. The reason why is because what we're talking about here isn't a enterprise phenomenon, or it's it's a human phenomenon. And and just to show you what I mean. Think about us as consumers. I don't know about you guys, wherever there's got listeners all over the world. I'm in the states, um, and here in the states, as is often the case, I do a lot of buying on Amazon, as my whole family does. Ninety percent of what we buy in the south seems like it comes in through the front door in a box with a yep. smile on it, right? So the uh, so for those that about half of your listeners, our listeners will know what I'm talking about when I say this. But there's this really interesting phenomenon when you're shopping on Amazon because you've got all this information and you've got all you've got. I can socially norm, right? I can see what other people like me, what they bought, what they like, so I can read a review and another review and another review, and then oh, people like this also bought that, but people like that also bought that. At some point, I'm just overwhelmed. It's two o'clock in the morning and I'm just trying to buy a $15 <laughs> gadget and I still haven't pulled the trigger because I'm just completely overwhelmed. I think, well, what if like there's FOMO or fear of missing out? There's like, you know, the social norming I can't stop doing. And so what's interesting about this, Tim, is Amazon kind of knowing this may happen has kind of got your back. They literally have a button on the app or on the website called save for later. So you could just defer the whole thing. Yep. You can just save for later, go to bed, say, you know what, I'll come back to it. I often tell this story. So I often check because I just find this fascinating. My wife, who's amazing. Um, has 1,500 items saved for later on her Amazon account. That's 1,500 buying decisions that got deferred or stalled because she just either got frustrated or she just got like, I just ran out of time or she just couldn't stop. She couldn't pull herself out of learning mode. And I think that's what, what's happening in B2B and B2C um, is, is, again, it's not a it's not a company phenomenon. No. It's a human phenomenon where we just... We're in getting overwhelmed, we can't just seem to overcome the escape velocity of a buying decision or, or, or make the buying decision, which I think is super interesting. And, and I think it's a great um, thing about uh, Amazon, which is that they've taken as much friction out of the buying process as they can, uh, apart from having that screen that I always get about um, Amazon Prime, which I always click through. Um, right. but, actually, but actually, that confuses my mother. She won't buy off Amazon because she gets confused, but she's 85. Um, I've got five. Things, eighty-five. <laughs> I've got five things in the um, in the save for later thing. Maybe that's a, a blog. There's a blog in that. I don't know. Um, I mean, it's, it's fun to think about, but, but also then Adam it raises an interesting point about truth. Like you know, we live in this post-truth world. Uh, much of my graduate work way back when, when I was doing political science in German, was um, was in post-structural you know, a philosophy and post-structural colonial theory and things like that. And you get into Foucault and Derrida and, and linguistics and you begin to question the meanings of words and all that super, super interesting until you see it actually play out in our politics. Then it gets actually terrifying, right? But now we're seeing it play out in commerce as well. And so I think the whole thing sums up, Tim. We, so if you think about so 
to think, bring it full circle to this opportunity for differentiation in a, in a time, in a world, in a time where customers are really lacking confidence to pull the trigger. Then I think there's three underlying drivers of, of confidence erosion. There's three forces eroding customer confidence. And it isn't about, it isn't about the economy, which by the way, I think exacerbates is makes things harder. But I think the reason why customers struggle to decide is not because of the economy, it's because of their humanity. And the three forces that really make this hard are one decision complexity. So it's all the people involved, all the stages. I don't even know how my company makes decisions. So there's decision yeah. complexity, there's information, um, information overwhelmedness, if that's a word. Yeah. Uh, inform let's call it, and then there's, and the third one is value, what I would call value opacity. It's just like, it's unclear. And this goes back a little bit to Adam's point about, is this really valuable? Am I going to get the value from it? How do I measure value? And if I'm not sure how to navigate my own decision-making process, if I'm not sure which information to prioritize, and if I'm not sure how I even define value, I'm going to sit on it, right? I'm going to think harder and research more, do more work, or just defer the decision down the road. So the opportunity for differentiation today is how can you as a seller or as a sales organization, a marketing organization, solve for customer confidence? So it goes from what we sell to how we sell to how we help, and specifically how we help our customers not feel more confident in us or our product or our brand or us as a seller and become a trusted advisor. How can we help our customers feel more confident in themselves and their ability, despite all of these forces, to make at least decent, educated, uh, defensible, there's a good word, yes, decisions on behalf of their organization. And I think that the, the, the supplier, the sales rep, the whoever it might be that we're talking about here, who can make customers feel that way, to create that feeling in themselves of the customers like, I feel good about this. I feel confident about this. I feel we can move forward. That's who's going to win in this world. Mm. So you, you talk about um, being helpful, being the next stage. So, so how do you see sales evolving and what's this next stage that, that, that's coming? So as much as I'm kind of known as, along with Matt, my co-author, and, and a lot of us are known as the, the, challenge, the challenger guys. I don't know if I'm known yeah. as the challenger guy, but you know, we're known for the work and, and, and the heart soul of that work, as many will know, is about frame breaking. So identifying a customer's mental model of how they think about their business. And then so you build the model, you break the model. So we call that frame breaking. I, by the way, I stand by that. I think if nothing else, I geek out about it because it's fun. I'm a contrarian at heart. So that's why I love to do that book in many ways is autobiography. But I think there's this really interesting moment right now where we can move our mindset from frame breaking to frame making. Right. And one, one might argue it's splitting hairs, but I think there's a real difference, at least in mindset, which is not so much how do I figure out what you think and break it, um, which is a simplified and somewhat unfair articulation of challenger, uh, but rather how can I just help you, how can I provide you a framework? How can I provide you a framework for information? So here's the, you know, what I mean by that is, here are the three or four questions that probably matter most. So it's an acknowledgement to your customers. Look, there's a lot of information out there. I would imagine it's pretty overwhelming. As, as we've worked with other customers like you, it's my all-time favorite phrase, and working with other customers like you, one of the things we found is if you can answer these four questions in a way that you feel good about, um, that, you, that you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be able to make some progress. So in other words, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm not telling you the answer. I'm just providing a, I'm narrowing the, I'm chalking the pitch. I'm narrowing the field, giving you a framework within which you can operate with a little bit more confidence. I can do that around information. I can do that around buying. So in working with other customers like you, we found that there's three, there's three steps you got to go through. You got to get procurement involved. You probably want to get them involved early. When you do, here's three yeah. questions they're, they're going to ask. So that's what we call that buyer enablement. So I can, buyer enablement is, is around the buying process, sense making around information, and then value, which is the world I live in now at Ecosystems, the company I just joined, around here's how to think, here's some ways you might think about getting value. Here's the outcomes you're trying to achieve. Here are the KPIs that other companies like you have used to determine their, their progress against that, uh, those, those outcomes. So I, I call this a framework for buying a f or a framework for deciding, if you like. This really what is a framework for buying, a framework for information, and a framework for value. These are different kinds of frameworks that one can build in a, in a frame-making process. And the whole idea is, it's very Socratic, I think. It, it, the whole idea is to provide frameworks within which your customers can come to their own conclusions in a more confident manner. Because that's what you're solving for is customers' confidence. So there, one last thought on this, Tim, and then I'd love to get your thoughts on, but I get all excited about this because I think it's really interesting because notice your role as a supplier. And this is a little scarier in the sense that what do I do if I give them confidence and they choose someone else? I mean, that's always the question of everything ever I've been involved in. Same thing used yes. to happen with Challenger, right? Yeah. But, but 
I come back to there, there's a there's a guy named Brian Smith. It's Brian with a Y. Brian is is the chief strategy officer to a company called Expedient. It's a cloud computing company. He's brilliant. I spend some time talking about what they're doing at Expedient in the sense making article. And and I've back when we used to travel early on prior to the pandemic, I was doing his sales kickoff, and I heard Brian say to his team, I'll never forget it. He said to his entire global field sales team, he said, "Our job as a supplier is to help our customers make the best decision they can in as little time as possible." Right. And if that decision is for someone else, so be it. We'd like it to be us and we'll do everything we can to make it for us. But I need them to one, make a decision, not just, you know, just kind of just draw this thing out. It's like, how do we help them make the best decision that they can, that they feel good about in as little time as possible? The old thing about, you know, like if you're going to lose in sales, lose early. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's the way to look at it. I just I love that phrase because I think it captures so much of what this is all about, which is how can we help our customers make the best decision that they can, that they feel really good about, and how can we do that in as little time, uh, as little time as possible? And then there's some graduate level things around how do we skew that in our favor. But I don't. Do you buy that, Tim? What do you think? What, what I, do you I, I think it's a. I think I think that's great advice. Um, I mean, you know, there's a saying, isn't there, that time kills a sale, um, yeah. and um, I know that Keenan did a, a, a piece to uh, camera the other day about it, it it's not about but but at the end of the day his conclusion was it's about helping and yeah what we do is we help people make decisions and it, and and it may be for us it may be for someone else but it ultimately it's about supporting that decision and i think I, i'm with you uh, it, which is i think that we have this 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 situation where people are scared to make decisions i'm going to get fired um yeah or, or, and what we need to do is give them the the, the comfort and it's not about us because we've kind of proved that because we're in the we're on the short list of two or three so we don't need to prove anything yeah you know i'd sum it up with a simple phrase which is you know we spend so much time particularly in sales saying how can i get them to buy that right yeah. it's a little crass but that's if i boil it all down that's kind of what we talk about right so how do i get them to buy and i think the better way to think about it today is how can i help them decide and that's yeah. a very different mentality rather how do i get them to buy how do I help them to decide? Uh, and because in many ways, what we have here is is not a buying challenge; it's a deciding challenge, and that's our role. Is to I think our the incremental opportunity we have is to to help them to decide. So, so very quickly, um, yeah. um, when we talked in the past, you said that there were three things that were really key right now, which was community partnerships and ecosystems. Explain. Yeah. So, so this is something I saw coming over the horizon at Gartner before my departure. Over the last year or so, it was very interesting. You know, when you talk to many, many sales ex or sales leaders, commercial leaders, marketing leaders, as as one does at, at a place like Gartner, um, you you kind of have your finger on the pulse. So it's always interesting to see how these trends kind of come over the horizon, sometimes out of nowhere. And about twelve months ago, three words in conjunction with one another came over the horizon very quickly. Again, as you mentioned, it was. Uh, communities, ecosystems, and partnerships, and I think it speaks to this broader um, this broader um, uh, phenomenon or set of phenomena that we're talking about here. Around uh, one of the best ways to go to market, I think, in this environment is is together as a as a as a broader solution. In some ways, I think it's the extension of the solution selling play, where yeah. I'm taking my capabilities and matching them with someone else's capabilities and going to market together, but doing it in partnership with our customers, so we're collaboratively with our customers sitting down to figure out what's most important for their business what are they ultimately trying to achieve uh, and how can we how can we work together to 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 build that the, those outcomes i think there's there's a longer story maybe for a second conversation sometime tim around the tech industry and plg or product led growth if you think about product led growth that goes all the way back to that first phenomenon of we're going to compete on product and it's interesting because when you're a product led company and you're trying to compete on product at some point, you don't have to worry about solution selling and fast replicators because you've got an exit. You just like, I need to sell this thing before I get to the point where that window closes. And yeah. so it changes the math and the mentality of the whole thing. So I think that some, in some ways what's happening is a lot of our friends in the tech industry are seeing this, you know, spam the world with BDR and SDR calls. It's like, I think we all know that time is over, right? This is not working it, because one is we're all tired of it, but two, once you stop working, you know, it works when you're working off a small denominator because anything works when you're working off a small denominator. But as you as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can't scale those kinds of activities. And so that's when they find that the, 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 there's no more juice in the lemon to squeeze. Uh, and so they're looking for a new way to compete, a new way to go to market. And I think that's where this idea of partnerships and ecosystems becomes really important, particularly for small companies. It's kind of like the school of fish, you know what I mean? It's like if I'm if I'm a fish, I gotta I gotta school together, and I think that's what's going on. Is that's the way you compete with the shark? Is you you band together, and make a big school. 
there's some weird metaphor mixed metaphors going on there I, i'll <laughs> fail to explore right now but but you kind of get the idea hopefully fantastic brent so um uh Unfortunately, time's up. I've actually got two questions because I put yeah. a note out internally and I said I was interviewing you um, and I got two questions. Um, so Eric Doyle, uh, <laughs> who works for one of our partners, um, came up um, uh, and he, he, he actually mentions the page of The Challenger. But you may be like me. I don't even remember writing my books. So I, I, when someone comes to me and says, on page 23, you wrote this, I, I go... I used to have to get the book out and actually have to have a look. But anyway, uh, on page 18, you talk about sales reps, five sales reps profiles. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Well, I mean, the whole book is about the five profiles of sales reps. So I so, yeah. so do, do those five sales rep profiles, do you think today they still hold up? I, I do. In fact, if you ask our colleagues over at the Challenger Company, which ultimately was spun off by, by Gartner, um, they continue to gather data on that. Uh, the... The, the thing about those profiles, and I've always said this, is that the worst thing you can ask yourself, or at least the least accurate thing you can ask yourself when looking at those five profiles, there's a hard worker, relationship builder, uh, challenger, lone wolf, and problem solver. Um, the, the natural tendency, Tim, when you see those five profiles is ask, which one am I? Or even more fun, which one are you? Um, yeah. uh, and and I, I would always encourage people to actually not ask that question because the whole, the basis of the research, we go in this sum in the book, and then we, it's a longer conversation, but the, the research was based not on personality types or or talents or traits, things you were born with. They were based on behaviors uh, and activities. So so the question is not which one am I? Am I a challenger? Am I a relationship? But rather, irrespective of whatever I think I might be, what are these challengers doing that's so different? How can I do some of that too? Um, and I think that's a better way to think about it. But I think the, those activities still hold, but now within this broader context of the confidence challenge, which was nowhere on our radar screen 10 years ago. So I, I'd say uh, yes with a caveat. I think, I mean, what Eric said to me was that when he read the book, um, he realized he had 15 lo lone wolves. Um, yeah, uh, watching to him. I've heard that a lot. Um, yeah. and, um, and, I, and I see that a lot. Um, and then I think he stepped back and, and there was a, you know, well, there's actually a little bit of, of, of everything, you know, um, you know, as a, as a salesperson, I like to take control. Um, because if I don't take control, I, I need to be in control of the deal. 100%. Most um, sales reps in some way, at least good sales reps, have a little bit of the control freak in them. Yeah, I, I yeah, totally yeah. relate, by the way. <laughs> so, so, yep. so the second part to the question, Brent, is yeah. um, with those five sales rep profiles, he, he said in the back of the book, there is a fantastic table around the those five sales reps profiles and the impact on hiring. Yeah. Do, do you think that um, that does that still hold? And what's your view on hiring against those five sales reps profiles? I think so. So we did a lot of work over the years around hiring profiles. Uh, much of that has gone over to the challenger organization. Um, that IP, they now own most of the IP of the of the work. And the uh, I, I would say yes, yes, but so I, I, the hiring for challenger behaviors or challenger skills, demonstrated challenger skills, I think is really, really important. So your ability to teach, tailor, take control. Um, these things don't have to be um, mutually exclusive. The other things I would look for today would be, and probably always would have all along, is empathy and curiosity, right? If you're, if you're going to solve for how customers feel about themselves. In fact, that the heart and soul of Challenger truly is actually empathy. It's a, that blue book you just held up in the very back of the book, the, the word empathy is nowhere in the book except for one spot. It's in the acknowledgments at the very, very end of that. I buried it like an Easter egg, but that entire book is about empathy. So trying to get into the shoes of your customers, see how they perceive the world. What is their mental model? The, I, the thing I used to say is, if you're gonna challenge the way a customer thinks about their business, what's the first thing you have to understand? And if it was just their business, I would say, no. If you're gonna challenge the way a customer thinks about their business, first thing you have to understand is how they think about their business. You need to build yeah. their mental model. You need to see it from their perspective uh, so that you can find ways to, uh, to challenge it. Um, diplomatically, professionally. But today, I think in, a, in addition to that is this idea of I need to understand just how hard it is for my customers to buy. I need to understand the emotional impact of trying to herd the cats and the credibility on the line. And what if we get this wrong? That's yeah. always been true. I think it's now more true than ever before. What's the, what's the mentality of someone clicking save for later? 
You know, I've just spent three hours trying to buy a $15 product on the Amazon. I click save for later. That is not a joyous moment. That is a moment of a defeat of like, oh, fine, I'll just go to bed or fine, I'll just buy something. If you can get into the head of your customers from that perspective and understand that emotional journey and tap into it, not in a manipulative way, but in an empathetic way, and just be there to be the one that provides help. I think that is super powerful. Now, how you hire for that, uh, there'll be professionals out there in hiring would know better than I would how to find that and profile that and look for it. But I think that would be a critical skill today. And I, I sometimes you just know it and you, you see it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I totally understand it. Yeah. Um, Brent, um, thank you so much yeah. for, for coming up today and, and talking to us. Always, and, Tim. I'm, I'm happy to come back whatever you guys want. Just say the word. <laughs> insightful as always. Um, uh, just, just there is a um, a, a user s- that said, "Will the session be recorded and accessible?" It, it, it is recorded. It's on LinkedIn because we've done a LinkedIn live. Um, because you're a LinkedIn user, I don't know who your name is, but for some reason it, it's not come through. But it's you can re re watch it. I will be putting it on YouTube just so you know, so it will be there on on my um, uh, YouTube uh, page as well. So uh, uh, I'm just going to put up this comment, uh, but I haven't read it. It's part of the training. It's cool. Uh, exactly. Thanks. I appreciate that. The, the, it's been very humbling. I'll tell you, Tim, all joking is not that there was a lot of joking anyway, but the impact that this work has had has been intensely humbling to, to have uh, you know, like that. I, it's just it's uh, and not something I could have ever imagined personally or professionally. But the fact that this work has helped some in their careers uh, is is intensely gratifying. But it's all of everyone out there who's taken these ideas and applied them with bravery, with curiosity and done amazing things with them. My, my hat's off to all of you. So cheers. And, and 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 I'm 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 sorry, but I'm gonna. I, I've had people come to me and say that that you know, and I still do have people that come to me and say that my book changed their lives. Yeah. Uh, and and it is it, the first time it happened. I just sat there with my mouth open. Yeah. Because I gobsmacked didn't... is the word. I think you, you, the Brits. I, I love I, the word gobsmacked. Right. Gobsmacked. <laughs> yes. I'm, I was gobsmacked. Yes. It's an, which is yeah. an English English word. Yeah. I, I just didn't when I was writing it. I just. I wrote, I wrote the book because my dad's got dementia and I just wanted him to, 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 to see that his son had done something yeah. with his life. And I yeah. never thought it would sell like it did. And I never thought I would have people coming to me. And, I, and, 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 and I've had people come to me and they can't speak. Yeah. Because they're stars. And, and it's like, I'm just Tim Hughes. I, I'm with you. I'm just a schlub from Omaha. I tell you, I, I the same thing. Yeah, but, but what that tells me, Tim, honestly, is everyone listening and will listen to this someday that could be you too. We're just, you and I are yeah. just dudes, right? We're just people. We're just humans. And there's no reason why any one of us and every one of us can't contribute in some fashion or another. And that's what what I think is so magical about all this. Is it's and really I, and, I, and I, I, I was thinking today when I was trying to find your book, I'm su- sure yeah. I read it on the train down to London one day. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure I sat there and I thought, I wish I could write a book like this. And there you go. Now it's sitting right behind you, uh, over and, your and, left shoulder, and, and 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 everybody can do this, and and it and yeah. and 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 you know, um, and it's and and I highly recommend it. And if you and if you're watching this and you and you do want to do it, and I'm sure you you will agree with me, Brent. If if they reach out to us, we'll give you them give us some them, them some advice. Hundred percent. Yeah, always happy to help. You guys know where to find me. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also at a company now called Ecosystems, uh, which is ecosystems.us. Um, uh on the web and i'll take that offline i'm happy to talk to anyone more about what we're doing there which is super cool stuff thank you so much for today brent and thanks everybody for jumping in and the conversation it's been awesome really appreciate it cheers tim cheers everyone be safe out there. thanks thanks brent bye